It is so good to see you all this morning. It is bright and shiny and sunny and wonderful outside, and I love being in church on the Lord's Day. If you're new, I'm Jamie. I'm one of the pastors here. It is my honor and privilege to invite you to point your Bibles to the book of Galatians, chapter 3. The book of Galatians, chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, there's one under the chair in front of you, and you'll find our reading today beginning on page 973. So we're going to start reading um, Galatians 3, beginning at verse 6, which is in the bottom left-hand corner of the church Bible. And before we read, and as we delay even longer for the parents to check their kids in, um, I want you to know that the formatting uh, in your Bible is the work of the New Testament translators. So um, when you see paragraph divisions and chapter divisions and punctuation, those are there to help you as an English reader to read the original text and to understand it, which wasn't written in English, which was written the New Testament in Greek. And so uh, when I read verse 6, I take it as a setup for verse 7, not as the ESV takes it as a conclusion to verse 5. So the reading that I will do here in a moment, it won't match the formatting of the ESV or whatever Bible translation you have, may meet me, my, my reading of it, but not the ESV. So just so you know, that is, uh, that is how it's going to be read today. Uh, we'll read and then uh, pray, ask for the Lord's help on our time together, and then get to work. Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse 6, this is the word of the Lord. Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. In the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Let's pray. Father, it is one of the great honors of my life that I get to serve your people, to administer your word in this place, to those you have chosen, elected from before the foundation of the earth, to draw to your Son, to unite them to Him, to encourage them and strengthen them in Him, and to send them forth. Lord, we need refreshment, we need encouragement, we need your strength. Would you come to us today through your Word? to reveal your Son to us, give us eyes to see Him, and hearts to worship Him, and lives to follow Him. For Jesus' sake we ask, amen. If you wanted, you could row a boat from Piqua, Ohio to the Atlantic Ocean. If you've ever taken any of my biblical theology classes, you'll be familiar with this metaphor. But you could put a boat on the Miami River, downtown Piqua, and if you wanted, you could row following that river downstream, past Troy, into Dayton, where it would join up with other rivers, where it would continue on even further south into Cincinnati, where you would end up in the Ohio River. The Ohio River would carry you on downstream, west and southwest, past Indiana, Illinois, where eventually it would dump you into the Mississippi River. The Mississippi River would carry you even further south to the Gulf of Mexico, where you could sail, travel, paddle your way around Florida, which is the only way to travel in Florida, all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. The Bible is like this. You can put a boat on any text of Scripture, and the undercurrent of that Scripture 
will eventually lead you to one place, the glorious grace of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Every verse in the Bible is either looking forward to Jesus or looking back upon Jesus. And some verses do both. So no matter where you are in the Bible, that text of Scripture is leading you to Jesus. Sometimes this connection is easy to see. I mean, he's right there in the middle. Other times you have to let the the author of that passage tell the story, which eventually will end in the ocean of God and the glory of Jesus Christ. This is what Paul the Apostle is doing in Galatians 3. He's following the river in the Old Testament book of Genesis, the story of Abraham, and following its undercurrent all the way to Jesus. So far in the letter to the Galatians, Paul has reminded these churches there was only one way to be made right with God, and that is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Not by anything you've done, but by everything God has done in Christ. Those churches in Galatia had accepted a teaching that was contrary to this. They believed in order for a person to be right with God, they needed to believe in Jesus and live like a Jew. So instead of following the Bible's river to Jesus Christ, they sort of made their own way to be right with God. Their formula was believe in Jesus and keep Old Testament law, and therefore you will be righteous. And this is, they thought, how it has always been. A long time ago, God appeared to a man named Abraham and chose that man to be the father of his own special people. And God gave those special people His law. He taught them how He is to be worshipped and how they are to live before Him as His chosen people. That's how it was. Why would it be any different now? You want to be right with God? You do what the Bible says. You do what the law commands. That's what Abraham did. And Paul, who is himself a Jew, comes along and says, that's a false teaching. And he does so by showing the Galatians the real story of Abraham from the Bible. He says that my teaching, grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, is not my teaching. It's the teaching of the whole Bible. It's always been this way. Abraham lived 2,000 years before Christ, and yet he was saved in the same way as people living 2,000 years after Christ. Here's the big idea this morning. The blessing of God's righteousness has always come by faith alone, in Christ alone, therefore believe. The blessing of God's righteousness has always come by faith alone, in Christ alone, therefore believe. Believe. I trust that we'll see that as we work our way through the passage. Let's have a look at verse 6 and 7 again. Paul writes, Just as Abraham believed in God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. So to confront this false teaching going on in Galatia, that to be right with God you needed to live like a Jew, Paul calls upon Abraham the father of the Jewish people. One might even say, the first Jew. 
And let's see how Father Abraham was made right with God. Now, so you know, Abraham used to be called Abram. That's what his mama called him. He grew up as a pagan, an idol worshiper. Lived about as far away from God as one can. So imagine dance around fire, carve wooden images, worship the sun kind of guy. That's Abram. He also happens to be married to his half-sister, which is gross. There wasn't anything special about Abram. And had God not intervened in his life, he'd have spent the rest of his life as a pagan, lost under the judgment of God for his sin, far from God. But God did intervene. The Lord appeared to Abraham and told him, to take his half-sister wife named Sarai and to leave his hometown of Kentucky, apparently, (laughs) and to go to the land that God would give to him. And even though Abram and Sarai had no children, the Lord promised that he would make Abram the father of a great nation of people. He promised that in him all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And so Abram took his sister bride, packed his stuff, left Kentucky, set out for who knows where, to the unknown land that God promised to give him. Some years pass. Abram's old. Sarai's old. The house is empty. At a time in many men's lives when they're celebrating being great-grandfathers, Our father Abraham still has no children, no offspring, no nation of descendants. And so he complains to God, and God reaffirms his word. Abram, you will have a son. Look at the stars, number them. That's how many your offspring will be. And the Bible records in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, and he believed the Lord. And the Lord counted it to him as righteousness. This is what Paul wants the Galatians to see. How was Father Abraham made right with God? By keeping rules? By living like a Jew? No, by believing the Lord. Abraham believed God. Note, it doesn't say Abraham believed in God. James chapter 2 says that even the demons believe in God, but they're not counted as righteous. Abraham believed God, meaning he believed what God said. Abraham heard God's word heard God's promises, and believed God was good for it. And on the basis of that belief, faith, God counted Abraham as righteous. You see where Paul's going with this, don't you? Abraham didn't have to do anything to be right with God. He just believed what God said. He just believed that God was good for it. And the righteous thing, that was all God. It was God's doing. It was God's counting. It was God's reckoning. God's declaring that Abraham was righteous. How that worked, Abraham had no idea. And Paul wants the Galatians to know that God's declaration, God's counting of Abraham as righteous was not on the basis of Abraham's obedience. It was on the basis of Abraham's faith. Abraham heard God, believed in God's promises, believed that God would be true to His Word, And God considered him righteous. The the Galatians had done it all wrong. They had been misreading the Bible. 
Abraham's justification, that, that, that's the word that means that God declared him righteous. Abraham's justification came by means of Abraham's faith, not by Abraham's works. By believing, not by doing. That's how it was in Genesis 15. That's how it was in Galatia in Paul's day. And that's how it is today. God makes sinners righteous through faith alone. And so therefore, Paul says in verse 7, it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. There's a song I learned as a church boy. Some of you may know it. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. So are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Anybody know that song? There's like arm movements with it. It was like the Christian hokey pokey or something. I, I learned that song as a kid and I had no idea what it meant. That little song has profound theology in it. That those, the elect of God, who have been declared righteous by God, have received this declaration by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's how it was from the beginning, and God hasn't changed. The target hasn't moved. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so the Galatians need to know, and so do we, that it's not faith plus living like a Jew that equals righteousness. It's faith in Jesus, period. Just like Abraham. Cornerstone, Abraham had the same faith you have. He had faith in the same object as you have. And this is what Paul gets at next in verse 8. Let's read that again. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, the non-Jews, by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So if you've ever wondered how Old Testament believers were made right with God, here's your answer. In exactly the same way, New Testament believers are made right with God. By believing in God's Word, by trusting in God's redemptive promises as completed and fulfilled in God's Messiah. The whole Bible preaches this. So what did Paul mean that the Scriptures foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. How, how, does, how does Scripture foresee? Well, it's back to the river metaphor. The Bible is much more than a collection of interesting stories about the history of the Jewish people. The Bible is God-inspired collections of purposefully written, perfectly preserved stories of true events which on their own and together foretell of the blessing of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The undercurrent of each verse, when read with the eyes of faith, carries the reader to the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Paul says that the Scripture preached the gospel to Abraham. And he quotes from Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, that God had promised Abram a land and a lineage. And Paul's point here is to say that God gave that promise to Abram while he was still a pagan, while he was still uncircumcised. Not knowing God, not following God, not keeping God's rules. He was a sinner like everyone else. Headed for an eternity 
under the judgment of God for his sins. He wasn't chosen because he was righteous. God revealed himself to Abram and told Abram the blessing of his plan. And what did Abram have to do to get that blessing, to become a part of God's plan of redemption? Nothing. And that's just the point. Just believe that God was good for it. And he did. And he was done. Righteous. This was the gospel. The good news. The grace of God to save sinners from their sin. By faith alone in Christ alone. That those who are far from God will be brought near to God. Added to the family of God. By believing that God was good for it. That this promise as we read here, was good for all people, regardless of their ethnicity. All the nations of the earth will be blessed. All who call in the name of the Lord will be saved. One of the most profound realities that I have ever learned from Scripture is that the number 15 precedes the number 70. That's why I spent all that money in college to learn from the Bible. The number 15 comes before the number 17. More specifically, Genesis 15 appears before Genesis 17. More specific than that, Genesis 15, Abraham believed God, it was counted righteous, Genesis 17, Abraham received the sign of his righteousness in circumcision. Meaning, Abraham was declared righteous before he had the sign that he was. When God declared Abraham righteous, he was as much a Gentile as any Galatian, as any of us. So do you see why the Galatians were wrong? Not even Abraham was justified by his works. Not even Abraham was justified by receiving circumcision, by keeping the Old Testament laws. They didn't even exist then. Abraham heard the promise of God in the gospel and believed God was good for it. And God declared him righteous. He didn't know how it was going to happen. He didn't know how he would have a giant multitude of descendants. He just knew that God said he would. And he believed him. And the Bible says that God showed him Jesus. I mean, Lord Jesus himself said this in John 8, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Abraham believed God's promise would be fulfilled in the person of the Messiah. He saw Jesus, albeit from a distance, albeit dimly, but he saw Jesus. The promise that God had made in the past would be contained in Christ in the future. He didn't know how it was going to work out. He didn't know how long it was going to take. He just knew that God was good for it. And his, same, his faith, that same faith that was Abraham in that same God, contained in the same Christ, is what the Lord uses to save the Galatians in Paul's day. Is what God uses to save us in our day. The Bible is one story cover to cover about the glory of God in Jesus Christ. Let's look at verse 9. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. When the Galatians trust in Jesus Christ and receive the blessing that God had promised to give them, foretold to Abraham, they would be sons of Abraham, recipients 
of the same blessing that God promised to Abraham. So what is this blessing? It's the blessing that God would take sinners and make them righteous and add them to His family and to give to them a glorious future. The blessing that God would somehow not count a sinner's sin against them. The blessing of future glory, of a giant family, of joy everlasting. It was the promise of a city whose builder and founder is God. Those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham in that same blessing. And this blessing had nothing whatsoever to do with circumcision or law-keeping or living like a Jew. This blessing has everything to do with who God is, what God has done in and through Jesus. So what does it mean to be a man, a woman of faith along with Abraham? Well, it means to have a Christ-centered faith. Abraham looked forward to Christ. We, the Galatians, we look back to Christ and forward to Christ. The Galatian church looks back upon Christ where the promises of right standing with God, where the hope that is promised, the future that is promised, the internal inheritance inheritance that is promised in a new heavens and a new earth, there on the cross they have been secured. And on the cross, Jesus, our sin was counted against Him, and His righteousness counted to us. They look backward. They look upon the empty tomb, all the proof they needed that God would be good for it. They look back with faith that in Christ they died, and in Christ they've been raised. It's the same for all of us. If you've never looked upon the cross of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, do that today. Turn to Him and see the price penalty deserved by your sin and receive by faith God's declaration of righteousness, of right standing before God. Repent of your sins, believe and be saved and you, like many here, will be added to Christ, joined to Him and through Him receive the blessing of God that He gave to Abraham. Do that today before leaving. And tell someone about it. Well, you might be thinking, that sounds too easy. Just believe in Jesus and live however you want. I mean, it's faith alone, right? Yes. Augustine wrote, love God and do what you will. So you're saying I can just believe God and live however I want. And I'm saying absolutely yes. So long as you understand what is meant by the word want. You see, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you believe God and love God, you will want to please Him, to keep His commandments. You will want to do His will. You see, when you become a Christian, your heart is changed, and God's will takes over your will. And you do what you want. It's been said before, 
We are saved by faith alone, but not by a faith that remains alone. As sons and daughters of Abraham, our faith in God is expressed in our works. Good works are not the reason you're saved. Good works are the evidence that you are. It's the difference between the root of the tree and the fruit of the tree. The root of your salvation is God's grace. The fruit of your salvation is good works. This is what the Apostle James is getting at in his epistle when he says that faith without works is dead. He says, I will show you my faith by my works. Because good works are the evidence of saving faith. John Calvin is helpful here. Calvin writes of the connection between faith and works and how they work together. Calvin says it's like the relationship between the light from the sun and the heat from the sun. You can't have one without the other. The light of the sun produces heat from the sun. So when an object absorbs the light of the sun, particles inside of that object, they begin to vibrate. And that vibration releases heat. When we see the light of the glory of God in Jesus Christ, we absorb it. We we see it with faith. We receive it. And it excites affections in us. We fall in love with Him. And the result of this is good works. Heat. White, hot, Love for God expressed in living for Him, in doing as He pleases, in delighting in Him, in submitting to Him in all things. And this is the example that we see in the man of faith, in Abraham. Abraham believed God. And because Abraham believed God was good to do and accomplish His will, He set out from Kentucky to go to a land he did not know. His faith produced obedience. He had no idea where he was going. He just just knew who he was following. And that was enough. That's the essence of the Christian life. We don't always know where we're going. We just know who we're following. And we're good with that. He lived as a foreigner in a foreign land. He waited for the city of God to come. And even when his wife was too old to bear children, he believed God was good for his word. And she conceived and bore a son whom they named Isaac, who fathered Jacob, the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, through whom Messiah would come. Abraham is called the man of faith. Because he believed God. But anyone who knows the story of Abraham knows, though he was the man of faith, he was a man of, in parentheses, imperfect faith. He trusted God, yes, and followed Him into the unknown, yes. But if you know Abraham's story, you know that there were times when his faith waned, when he was not faithful. There were many times when Abraham failed to trust God. But even in this example, we see the glorious grace of God, that God kept His promise to Abraham, even when Abraham didn't keep His promise to God. Because even when God's people are unfaithful, God still remains faithful. So know then, Cornerstone, that it is those of faith in the same Christ, who are sons of Abraham. Like Abraham, we look to Christ. 
We look to Him for the forgiveness of our sins. We believe God. We believe what God has said. We believe that God will be faithful to His Word. Hebrews 11.11 has been an important verse to Sarah and I in our lifetime. The author there, speaking of Sarah, Abraham's wife, says, She considered him faithful who had promised. This is how we live as Christians. We believe what God has said. We believe that God is good for it. We believe that He will act. And we act in response to His faithfulness. Like Father Abraham, we set out, not always knowing where we're going, leaving the life that we once knew, going into the unknown, but trusting in the one who's leading us. The Apostle Paul put it like this in Acts chapter 20. He said, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, but having received a promise from God the Holy Spirit that affliction awaits me. And he says, but I do not account my life as any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. We are the same, constrained by the same Spirit, constrained to keep the same mission to give our whole lives to testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Like Father Abraham, we live by faith in God's promises. God has said, as someone reminded me in the foyer this morning, that all things, even suffering, work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. This is the promise of God, and so we believe Him. And we endure suffering with joy. Like Father Abraham, we live as foreigners in a foreign land, trusting that God will do for us as He has promised. And though we might not see the fulfillment of God's promises in full in our day, we know He's good for us. We refuse to get too comfortable here. We refuse to let down our guard and compromise with the world. After all, this is not our home. We have no lasting city here. We look forward to the city to come, a city made without hands, whose designer and builder is God Himself. We await the new heavens and the new earth with faith-filled patient endurance. We wait for the time when the dwelling place of God will be with man. We wait for the time when He will wipe away every tear, when death will be no more, where there be no mourning, where there be no crying, where there be no pain, where the former things will pass away, where all that is sad comes untrue. We wait with faith filled patient expectation because we know God has said it and He is good for it. And on this basis, we bank everything. We go to unknown lands, to unreached people groups, to proclaim the excellencies of Christ because we know He has promised all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And on that basis, we bank our marriages, laying down our lives for the one who secured our future by His life. And on that basis, we bank our savings and our ambitions. We've been guaranteed heaven, we've been, which has been secured for us by a risen Lord. And so we spend our lives for His sake, for His glory, for His purpose, for the advance of His gospel. And not for the preservation of our comfort. And on the basis of His Word, we serve our local church. We humbly submit to our leaders. 
We faithfully give to gospel work. We fight for the joy of the Lord. To maintain unity in the church. And we never give up praying for and working for the unborn to be saved. We never give up until human trafficking is ended. And we never give up until the entire porn industry dries up for lack of business. We keep working. We keep serving. We keep praying. We keep preaching. We keep proclaiming the excellencies of Christ until Christ is all and in all. This is what it means to believe. This is what it means to be a son and a daughter of Abraham. This is what it means to follow Christ, to believe God's Word, to believe He's good for it, and to bank everything on it. Let's pray. Lord, thank You for Your blessing. Thank You for revealing Your Son to us this morning. We confess that many times we have failed to believe Him as we should. We have not lived as people of faith. We have not lived as faith-filled, patient expectors. Lord, we've lived for ourselves, self-sufficient people, trying all that we can to manicure our lives, lying to others about who we are and how we are and lying to ourselves. Lord, forgive us for our doubt and our pride. In your mercy, bring our self-sufficiency to a tragic end in flaming fire. Use the least severe means to bring us to complete dependence on God. And give us grace not to spend our lives on frivolities and petty satisfactions. Lord, we have diseased ourselves. Will you come and save us? Reveal your Son to us anew. Grant to us the faith to believe in Him and to bank everything on Him. Make us a people of radical, joyful, delight-driven obedience. May our minds be occupied with the glories of God in Jesus. May our minds be occupied with more ways that we might share Him. Lord, give us cleverness in the ways in which we can share Jesus with the lost. And make us a people who are faithfully enduring through suffering patiently expecting the eternal rest in the new heavens and the new earth. Make us long anew for those golden streets, for that heavenly city where Jesus shines so bright, where our joy sits on a throne forever where we will be with him and he with us for age upon age without end. Amen. If you are trusting in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins an assurance of pardon can be found today in Romans chapter 4 verse 7 and 8. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin.